Hello, my name is Sam Feltham. I'm the Director of the Public Health Collaboration and welcome to the PHC Virtual Conference 2020. The coronavirus has changed all of our lives, but where there's an obstacle, there's also an opportunity. And that opportunity comes in the guise of this virtual conference. Earlier this year, we had to postpone our two main events, the annual conference and the Real Food Rocks Festival until next year. These events allow us to connect, learn and grow, but they also help us raise crucial funds for the PHC to continue. With that in mind, and before we let the next presenter speak, this virtual conference is 100% free for all. But if you find the content valuable today, then please consider donating £2 or whatever you can afford through the Total Giving website via www.phcuk.org forward slash donate. Or if you're in the UK, you can simply text PHC to 70660 to donate £2 directly from your phone. We hope you enjoy the conference from wherever you are in the world, and be sure to get involved in the civil conversation on the comments section here on YouTube or via the hashtag PHCVCon2020 on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. Thanks for your support, take care and stay safe. Hello to everyone in Public Health Collaboration and myself and Donald hopefully will show you some interesting material today. Um, we're going to focus on heart and chronic disease realities. So I don't have too many slides. The first one though is if you don't measure it you can't understand it. So this is a phrase we often use in engineering and if you don't measure it it don't get fixed. And that's another one. So measurement is extremely important measuring the correct things and knowing exactly what's going on with a problem if you want to resolve it or mitigate it. So David Bobbitt's story I'm going to go through really briefly and he's an owner of a very large corporation super fit slim running four times a week around eight years ago doctors said he was bulletproof. He actually got all the medicals that one would get executive medicals treadmill tests, everything, bulletproof, top 10% fitness for his age. Then he happened to get a calcium scan. And this is not done very often, but he was lucky to get one in the States, almost randomly. And he found out he had a huge score with multivessel serious disease, multiple blockages. And rather than being a 4 or 5% in framing him risk of heart attack, he was way up 50 to 70% risk of heart attack or death in the next 10 years. So everything changed because the calcium scan supersedes pretty much all other tests, especially blood tests. So he went, got very angry, did a lot of research, got an angiogram, multiple blockages, but he didn't need surgery, he found out. And he actually really needed nutrition and lifestyle fixes and some meds as well. So you actually don't necessarily need surgery with massive disease if you're asymptomatic. So that was a good thing. But he went on and researched more and he got a glucose meter and he found out after a meal his blood glucose was way up at 25 millimoles. So he discovered he was type 2 diabetic, undiagnosed, very severely so. And that would have been the primary driver of his hidden arterial disease. So after discovering all this, pure philanthropy, he's funded several million dollars to get the message out in CAC and heart disease and also made the Widowmaker movie, which is now free, the one hour version. But the key message here is he, like millions, had a problem that no one understood and no one measured and no one identified. And that was undiagnosed type two diabetes. So this theme is gonna come up again. So we have a new movie out now, which was partially uh, funded by David. And it's a great movie, I think. And Donald in the latter half of this presentation is gonna bring you through it. Just a couple of quick charts I've shown before, but I think they illustrate the point very well. Here's one for second heart attacks in men. And over seven years, they tracked them and had their bloods at the start to find out what kind of factors are predictive of a second heart attack. And they found out that high total cholesterol or LDL cholesterol predicted nothing. Not too shocking for some of us. They found out that hypertension doubled your risk of a second heart attack if you had high blood pressure. But the real thing they found was that high insulin, blood insulin, 
gave you nearly seven times the risk of a subsequent heart attack. And the really interesting thing is that high insulin and hyperinsulinemia drives a lot of the idiopathic hypertension. So the hypertension is a weaker risk factor and in a sense a lot of it is more related to insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia than anything else. Undiagnosed type 2 diabetes, that's the elephant in the room. So Euroaspire study in 2015 was very revealing and they surveyed all coronary disease patients across Europe. Well, not all of them, but a big sample representing all of them. And they had patients aged 18 to 80, so a full age spread, right? very good poll, and 24 European countries. So you can't argue that these guys didn't represent the reality out there. And they measured their glucose by multiple measures quite accurately. And what they found out straight away without any measurements was, wow, nearly a third of them are full type 2 diabetics, full blown, uh, just from their record. That's a lot. But with the glucose measures, they found out another quarter of prox were actually undiagnosed type 2 diabetics, full blown. Another quarter of prox were not technically diabetic, but they were high risk for type 2 diabetes, which is essentially diabetic. They were. And the remainder were not insulin tested. So we can only guess at how many of those were essentially type 2 diabetic who would fail a two hour insulin test. If you don't measure it, you can't understand it. And that's the big problem. We are not measuring properly. But the Euroaspire team did a pretty good job of measuring. And look what they found. Imagine we really measured properly what we'd see. Undiagnosed type 2 diabetes. It's kind of huge. The TOFI epidemic. You've heard the TOFI phrase, thin outside, fat inside. And this is a massive problem. Probably hundreds of millions of people out there have this challenge. Here's a representation, a six footer there with a BMI around 22. And he doesn't appear fat, but he's got visceral fat in the organs, intraorganal fat. And that's what brings the risk. And that's what reveals that you've got metabolic dysfunction or mayhem going on. So 40% approximately of non-obese are TOFI. That's a huge number. That's getting close to the number of obese. And TOFI heart attack risk essentially is right up there with the obese. So when a 50-year-old non-smoker drops dead, leaves three kids behind, you know, people wonder, oh, he didn't smoke. Oh, he wasn't obese. He wasn't overweight. Must have been genetics. Well, no, chances are he was a TOFI. So this is something we really need to address. If you don't measure it, you can't understand it. And we're not really measuring for TOFI, uh, which is a disgrace. Undiagnosed type 2 diabetes. It's a big deal. So, there's lots of other things besides hyperinsulinemia, insulin resistance, which is type 2 diabetes. Lots of other drivers of heart disease. You can see them here. I won't read through them. But let's be honest. If you want to focus on the elephant in the room, hyperinsulinemia, insulin resistance, and everything related to it, it's pretty much up there at the top. And we're kind of more focusing on cholesterol for the last 30 years. Undiagnosed type 2 diabetes. Have I hammered it home yet? Coronavirus. This is a very new challenge in the last few months, and it's causing major impacts and a lot of tragic deaths, for sure. But I wonder, could that be related to what I've just been talking about? Well, let's look at a clip from a New York doctor and viral expert who's been on the front line of dealing with the early wave. Let's see what he has to say. You've seen an interesting and, I guess, disturbing uh, trend of underlying conditions for those COVID patients. What are those? It's disturbing. It's, we're seeing a, a lot more diabetes than we've ever seen with any respiratory viral infection. We have 23 proven COVID patients. 13 are known diabetics. The other nine are pre-diabetic. So only one out of 23 hospitalized COVID patients that we're taking care of, proven ones, is not diabetic or pre-diabetic. In the severe form, 15 patients with severe um, COVID disease in the ICU on the vet. 10 of those patients had diabetes, four had pre-diabetes. Wow. The only one who didn't was a 94-year-old man. We don't know if he had either, the testing wasn't done, and we still don't even have his COVID test backs. So we're not even sure he fits that category. So the frequency of diabetes and pre-diabetes and 
is enormous and something I've never seen associated with any viral infection. Pre-diabetics are also at risk, especially if they have a high BMI. We haven't had anyone under 70 who didn't have a very high BMI or was pre or diabetic get seriously ill. So guess what? Undiagnosed or diagnosed type 2 diabetes is huge for susceptibility to this current problem and for nasty outcomes and, and deaths, actually. It's a huge risk factor, along with hypertension and many other pretty much related things related to metabolic syndrome. So this is even kind of pivotal in our current challenge, which is an acute challenge rather than a chronic disease challenge. So there you go. So I'm going to show now something, change the tone a little bit from hyperinsulinemia and show some emerging studies. And I'll take one of the best ones, but there's four now on vitamin D and coronavirus susceptibility. And here in this study, even after correcting for age and sex and comorbidity, insufficient people had 7.6 times the risk of death from coronavirus and deficient below 20 nanogram which is half of the UK basically, and very severely so in the BAME or BAME population, you know, dark skin people in the UK. Well, 10 times the risk for being below 20. And that's a huge cohort. So a 10 times risk in an associational study after some correction or regression is enormous. It's heading towards smoking and cancer, for instance. It's actually implying strongly that there's real causality. It's not like meat causing cancer, which is 1.1x multiplier, right? And we heard a lot about that one. So there's another study I'll just mention before I continue on vitamin D status, and that's selenium. A Chinese study, and there's more coming out, powerful correlations with the selenium availability in the region and with the selenium content as measured in the hair of victims. So again, I wouldn't overstress it, but it's just touching on factors that may be really, really important. And no one's really looking at them, not really talking about them. So we'll continue with D and just look at this 30 nanogram or above person who appears to have 10 times less risk after correction. Uh, what type of person is that? It's not just the D status. The D is acting as a marker of other things. So let's look at what they are. If the person ate nutritious, nutrient-dense, and generally D-rich foods, often animal-based, they will tend to be in the high over 30 group. If the person has avoided insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia, they will tend to be in that group because insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia, and metabolic syndrome drive down your D-status. It's a great marker. If they avoided inflammatory conditions or autoimmune problems, right, often dietary triggered, then they tend to be in this group, okay, because inflammatory conditions drive down D status. If they tended to get healthy sun without burning, lots of it for nitric oxide and many other photo products besides D, they tend to be in this healthy, 10 times lower risk group. And yeah, if they had supplements to jack up the D number, it would put them in the over 30 group, but it wouldn't be near as important as the four things I just mentioned. Right. So D status is turning out to be enormously important and it links very closely to everything to do with insulin resistance, leptin resistance and metabolic syndrome and inflammatory chronic disease. So I'm going to wrap up now before we go to Donal. Eating healthy foods, nutrient dense, often D rich, avoiding insulin resistance goes hand in hand. That makes sense. Getting healthy sun exposure and maybe supplements if you're very insufficient to get you on your way. It makes scientific sense. Vitamin K2, a lot of emerging science on that, not fully proven out, but for heart health and everything else, makes sense. Selenium I mentioned, not one that often gets mentioned, but very important in the immune system. Potassium, very important mineral that often people are quite low on. Magnesium, huge, so many reactions in the body, so much part of the human machine. And it's suspected that a huge number of people are insufficient or deficient in magnesium. And DHA, EPA, the old omega-3s, reduce your omega-6, your vegetable oils to a minimum and keep these guys high. Makes sense. And you know what? These are going to actually make sense in our movie too, which you'll later see. 
So Donald's going to bring you through that now. Thank you. She In 1991, Down defeated Meath to win the All-Ireland Senior Football Championship. The 104th All-Ireland Football Final is underway. Kane firing it forward towards James McCartan. Can he be a match winner yet? On to Ross Carr, a quick look up on sport. But here we are almost 30 years later, and we're going to find out not just who are the toughest anymore, but perhaps who's the most resilient and who's the healthiest. Everyone always says, oh, yeah, fit as a fiddle, um, super fit. Rambo, <laughs> fucking Rambo. <laughs> a bit of a shock result. Uh, he's come in over 1,200, Ivor. Oh, 1,200, that's a big score. No one has ever tested asymptomatic, healthy, retired, elite sportsmen for heart disease. They're firing well right now, Mead. Another scoring chance. Outside it comes to Bernard Flynn. Oh, it's not the point. Secure in his holding. It's touched down again to David Beggy. A real business like approach now from Meath, frantically pouring everything they have into attack. Of course, there's no ball this time, and the CT scanner is now the scoreboard. We will scan the players for heart disease, and the winning team will be the one with the lowest average calcium score. Even my arteries were that of an 86 year old. What the hell is going on here? Yeah, I have advanced heart disease. Why are we not looking for that? If we use this scan widely for middle risk people and we identify the truly high risk versus low risk, we could treat the high risk. I'm Dr. Tierney. I'm going to be uh, assessing some of the data today mm -hmm. and just to see that. Uh, the down team of 91. Uh, hello, Mr. <laughs> <laughs> How you doing? <laughs> if you You're thought, always good for a laugh, Benny. If, if, if you thought I was assessing your data, <laughs> oh, no. I'd give you a heart attack. I would be very worried. <laughs> I think the evidence is overwhelming <laughs> that coronary calcium scoring is the most predictive test for prognostic risk. So if you want to know what your risk is for heart disease, have a coronary calcium score. Thanks, Ivor. So that was the uh, trailer you just saw for Extra Time, our latest production. So Ivor joined me on that uh, alongside the IHDA, Irish Heart Disease Awareness, uh, whom Ivor works with closely. And I suppose I'm the one who has to put my hands up and admit that uh, this was a cheap shot because we were trying to reach middle-aged men in Ireland and we were trying to create a format that we could carry forward into other sports and other countries that would alert middle-aged men to something that they've clearly got little to no interest in, i.e. the risk for heart disease. So that's the first thing I would say. We were trying to reach the average male who's down in the pub watching sport, doesn't really give a second thought to his heart health or his metabolic health for that matter. Perhaps COVID might have helped since we made this movie, but I'm not sure how long that will last. So that was the ambition really to, um, to reach an audience that we, we keep missing. And I say that because I, I know from over the last sort of eight to 10 years, the audience that I've built up has been predominantly female in the 35 to 55 year old age group. And I'm sure many of you are experiencing the same thing. Women just uh, tend to have a, a better disposition towards uh, looking after themselves. And uh, I always say that the most dangerous thing in the, in the toolkit that a man possesses is the, the ego, the middle-aged ego, because we have a tendency to think that we're just gonna go on forever and that will never happen to us. So we were trying to, to really, I suppose, not just reach every middle-aged man, but in particular, the 40% who remain lean, but go on to develop metabolic disease. Asim talks about them a lot in, in the work I've done with him. And that's a particularly difficult sell because if you look lean, you feel good, and you're relatively fit, you think you're fine. Well, Extra Time, I think, uh, would be the movie that might uh, change the tone of conversation for, for many, we hope. And 
I suppose the, the, the first thing that uh, you do when you step out to, to make any movie is to expect the unexpected. That's my number one law of filmmaking, particularly the way I do it. We like to follow subjects and ideally individuals to see if we can uh, you know, identify maybe an Achilles heel and try and correct or fix that over a period of time. It's, it's always a roll of the dice because you never know what you're going to get. And in this case, we were dealing with, you know, 45 plus uh, middle aged men in average age, early 50s, but they had all been elite sportsmen. So we didn't really know, you know, what to expect. Would they reflect, you know, what you would expect to see in, a, in an average middle aged population? Does an elite sporting career help you as you age? And uh, we, we were, you know, interested to, to, to find out and we hoped that an audience um, would also be interested to, to take the journey with us. So we did expect the unexpected. And the first port of call for me with this project was actually Paddy O'Rourke, who was the captain of the the winning down team in that 1991 game. I had discussed it previously with uh, Dr. Peter Bruckner. We tried to get something going in Australia, and I hope we still can because we, we've now got a nice tight format that would allow us to replicate extra time with different sporting codes in different countries, of course. But um, Paddy was really the, the, the genesis of this because he contacted me a number of years ago to say that he'd seen serial killers, loved what I was doing. And, you know, a man who, who has dedicated his life to performance and is always looking for that little bit more for himself or his, or his athletes or his players, um, it came as no surprise. And I know Paddy personally that he, he took an interest. So I just put it to him that I felt that we, we were missing the target with middle-aged men in Ireland and could we do something like this? He looked at me and said, let's let's go. Um, that was several years ago. And it was only with, you know, Ivor's introduction to uh, David Bobbitt and the IHDA that ultimately made this come about because this was a big, unwieldy monster of a production. And it certainly turned into something much bigger, uglier and uh, more difficult than I think any of us had anticipated. So I wanted to step back from the data a little bit and just, you know, talk you through what, what happened. And... The first thing, when we rolled the cameras, Paddy O'Rourke was the first player that we interviewed and Yolanda, the director, just turned to me and said, well, he's clearly our lead man. Now, I thought I was, you know, very smart having done my prep, prep and prep again routine because we got a hold of Paddy's uh, very detailed, latest um, deep dive, uh, you know, medical uh, test that he had had done way beyond just, the, you know, the, the standard blood work. And that indicated that he was indeed in, in fine shape. He'd been seeing a cardiologist for 20 years and there been, have been no flags anywhere. And um, the only thing that we did make a little side note on was the fact that he had family history. But what we thought we were seeing at that stage was somebody who had taken that on and beaten it. And boy, were, were we and, of course, Paddy in for a very big surprise. To go back to 1991, just to set the scene, um, to give you an idea of the impact that this, this type of story will have in Ireland, 61,000 people went to the game in Croke Park in Dublin that year and many millions more would have watched it both at home in Ireland and uh, of course globally. So it's our biggest sporting event every year. I think you know the, the FA Cup back in the day in England, uh, the, the grand final in Australia or the Super Bowl in America. It's, it's huge in Ireland. So these men and these players and particularly the stars of these teams would have been household names. And, you know, many would still be household names to people of a certain age, sort of 40 plus. And um, we just thought it, be, it would be interesting to regroup and see where they all are now and use that game and that bit of nostalgia to draw in an audience and hook those middle aged men who, you know, they give a they give a damn about sport and a few pints down the pub. But uh, that's where it begins and ends. Heart disease is not on their radar, but we had them on ours. So the whole idea, you know, was really to, to um, spark inspiration. If we can get people thinking about their heart health who otherwise weren't, then that's a result. And um, we did that by, you know, creating a replay of sorts, you know, between these two teams. Uh, of course, it wasn't on the pits this time. And uh, you've seen the stat there that, that you know, the... These players are second only to Australian rules footballers in terms of the mileage they cover per minute on, on a field of play. So their training was ferocious. The games were ferocious. They were very physical. And wouldn't it be interesting to know 
what sort of shape they're in now, you know, almost 30 years later. So that, that was the, uh, the starting point. But the scoreboard this time, of course, became the, the CSE scores. And we just took, a, took an average for each team. And that became the simplex way to, to carry what is, I, I guess, a very complex message. But the message we wanted to project was just that if you're a middle-aged bloke, you should know your score. And in the course of that, of course, that, that number one law of filmmaking jumped up and bit us because although we had prepped, prepped, prepped and done all we could, we got some very unexpected results. I was going to get into the data, but what that meant from a filmmaking perspective was that we had to push things right out. We were dealing all of a sudden with scores that were way beyond what we had expected. And... We needed to now see if we could do something about that and the movie became uh, really a, a journey with Paddy O'Rourke because Paddy scored over 1200 and despite the great blood work his you know physique and his super you know cardiovascular fitness per se he was in the bottom one percentile for arterial health which was really an atrocious result um, I found it very difficult to, to, to take that on board and I really didn't, I didn't quite know what to do. And it was at that point that myself and I either kind of, you know, rallied together and, and formulated a, a protocol, you know, based on, on, on the best available um, evidence and uh, clinical uh, studies and, and uh, you know, clinical results that, you know, some of the, the cardiologists you see in the movie had, had themselves seen. So we were doing our best, but there were no guarantees that Patty was going to come out on the right side of this. Um, fortunately, you know, if you follow the movie, you'll see that that he managed to do so. And um, that, I suppose, is the the nugget in this movie, because, you know, Dr. Scott Murray has said that this will now inform research from a, a preventive cardiology perspective. And that's huge. You know, for a movie to impact um, meaningful research, is a is a great result if we can do it in other countries and other codes fantastic again but um, patty o'rourke is now very firmly a subject of research with you know the top research cardiologist back in northern ireland patty donnelly so that's very exciting for i think myself Ivor, and the ihda to, to have achieved that and we sincerely hope moving forward that extra time can maybe just provide a, a grain of data and information that um, can lead to something much more prolific and, and and that's really the objective so i suppose it takes me to you know my conclusion is that you know the, the number one law for perhaps for um you know heart disease is, is to prevent 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 and you know scott made a comment it's not on camera but i, I thought it was very applicable that everybody should behave as if you've got heart disease because if you haven't you're probably going to and you know that's that's really the rule of life. The older we get, um, the greater that that uh, that risk, and it starts to apply to all of us. You, you'll see my own journey in, in the movie there because I know that that my own family suffer on both sides. Despite you know great sporting and athletic careers, it doesn't matter. You've got to establish where you are, take the information, and move forward with that. So that was the objective of extra time. It was it was um, it was revealing. It was scary. It was. Uh, much more difficult than anything I'd done before, but we're ready to, to buckle up and, and, and go again. Uh, Peter Bruckner has mentioned the AFL Grand Final of 1989, so um, how cool would that be to take it down to Australia where we've, we've always had a great following with the movies uh, and, and to spread the message a little bit further amongst Australian middle-aged men. So here's to that, and, and we'll see you in 2021 with our next movie. Cheers. Great stuff, Donald. Good man. And as we said, I'm going to finish with the calcium scores of our sporting heroes and look at some of the blood test results that we got, which I haven't published before. So we can see the CAC scores there on the left from the top scorers down to zeros. And um, we're missing a few. We're missing Paddy and a couple of the others. But these are the ones we had full blood tests for. So let's look at what the blood test told us. Blood glucose. Yeah, this is a heat map and it indicates there's a bit of a tendency for higher glucose up in the higher scores, but you couldn't really be sure. A1C, again, a tendency towards higher values, a trend, but individual decisions on who's in trouble wouldn't be so easy. Cholesterol, of course, fails miserably, but we've grown to expect that. 
HDL, again, a tendency of for lower HDL in the higher scores, you know, so it kind of indicated LDL, <laughs> done to the glass, as per usual. Triglycerides, yeah, a couple of high levels up there in the higher scores, but, you know, there's a high level down in the low score, zero too, so not so great. And then total cholesterol over HDL, reasonable. Here we've got the ratio, and we know the ratios tend to be more powerful in predicting risk. But still, there's no way you could judge who is at high risk or not without a calcium score. The blood tests just don't hack it. And I'll just leave you with Rowan Atkinson summing up what I think about the blood tests, really. Just a wild stab in the dark, which is incidentally what you'll be getting if you don't start being a bit more helpful. <laughs>